Hello everyone, my name is Ruben Major. I'm an instructor for EMS University as well as the program manager in Arizona and the chief executive officer. Uh, today in this particular section we're going to be discussing basic vital signs. Uh, vital signs overview, uh, what we're going to be discussing today, uh, level of consciousness, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, lung sounds, skin, and pupils. And let's go ahead and get started with pulses. Now for pulses in the adult, the normal rate is about 60 to 100. So it's very similar to what a good blood sugar should be. And that's always helpful in that particular area too to remember that both of them are uh, fairly similar. The rhythm is going to be regular or irregular and the quality is strong or is it weak, thready, bounding, uh, just depending on whatever it is that's going on with the patient uh, may, may manifest certain symptoms or certain signs rather. And then the location uh, where you're taking the pulse, is it radio, is it brachial, is it carotid? Uh, if we want to go back a little bit to rate, so anything under 60 is going to be considered bradycardia, and anything over 100 is going to be considered tachycardic. Now, again, we have a big, huge range like this because all of the patients are not necessarily the same. There's a lot of things that could be causing an elevation in your pulse rate as well as a reduction in it. So you have to really consider what it is exactly that's going on with a patient as far as their rate's concerned, which might be responsible for making it elevated. Uh, normally speaking, when your patient is just sitting there and has been sitting there for a while, if their pulse rate is elevated, there's going to be a problem. Uh, you know, if it's over 100, it's kind of questionable as to why. So do they have, have they had a fever? Do they have issues with uh, some kind of a heart condition? Is there an inf infection going on? Uh, you know, what exactly is at play? Also, uh, in car accident scenes, you'll see that, you know, a lot of times people will want to hover around the 120 to 140 zone and that might not necessarily be in and of itself indicative of the patient being in shock but it might just be more of an issue of the patient is agitated or they're anxious about having just got into a to an accident or experienced some sort of traumatic event recently and then for that reason their heart rate's elevated uh, the flip side is true with the rate for bradycardic patients, those that have been, you know, relatively active or who are sitting, sitting there, maybe not necessarily sleeping, but say they have a heart rate of 40, you know, that's, that's a concern of mine. Uh, there, there should never be a time when the patient's heart rate is, is at 40 or, uh, 40 or below. Uh, that means there is a true medical emergency and something needs to be done as soon as possible. So, in any event, going to rhythm, when we talk about rhythm, you know, is it regular, is it irregular, what we're saying, is, what we're trying to figure out is, is there some kind of an arrhythmia with the heart, and sometimes this can be indicative of either a heart condition or even dehydration can cause an irregular heart rhythm. And uh, quality, you know, weak, thready, and bounding. So those kinds of things are going to be indicative of different issues. If your pulse is weak, maybe your blood pressure also is a little bit low. You know, if it's thready and bounding, you know, or if it's thready, then that could be, you know, the same or similar issue. There could be an issue with the patient might be experiencing shock and then bounding. So, you know, why is that? Why is the pulse bounding? Why is it so strong, uh, super strong? You know, there's got to be a, a reason for that. So, the, again, when we look at signs such as these, we have to take them in consideration uh, with everything that's going on with a patient, not just the signs in and of themselves are a problem, but what is it exactly or how is it exactly that the patient is manifesting other symptoms 
or problems related to these particular signs such as a pulse and then the location so you're gonna check uh, normally you're gonna be checking for a radial pulse if you can't feel a radial pulse you can check for a carotid when you check for a carotid pulse you'll be doing that a lot of times as well when the patient's unconscious because there's no point in checking the patient's radial pulse unless you're in a triage situation and we'll go over that in the triage section if you're going to be sticking around for that the uh, the brachial is used mainly or primarily for children so let's talk a little bit about respirations so normal respirations for the adult are anywhere between 12 and 20 so you'll see or you may see test questions on you know patient that has been breathing at about 28 times a minute or you know they're, they're breathing at about six times a minute that could be an issue of rate and if the rate is elevated then there could be an issue with um, obviously there could be some issues with just about anything and so that's not good if we can what we'll try to do is assist them with their breathing when it's elevated and then also assist them with their breathing when it's really low as well and again you'll go a little bit more over this information in the respiratory section in the patient assessment area and then you have rhythm and pattern so is the pattern of breathing normal or do we have seesaw breathing do we have breathing that is extremely rapid and short? Do we have uh, breathing that is fast and then, and then it goes back to being slow and then it goes back to being fast? All of these can be indicative of other issues. So those are going to be things that you're going to want to note and then match them up to other signs and symptoms that might be indicative of whatever patient condition that you think that you are particular patient might be experiencing and then depth and quality so you know is this is this respiration uh, the kind of respiration that is really short and there's not a whole lot of air intake uh, or is it a good strong breath so it just really depends on the situation could is it agonal breathing so you know lots of different things to think about with this particular section you know, we just talked about some kinds of abnormal respirations. You know, you have chain stokes respirations. And chain chain stokes breathing is, uh, you know, generally associated with uh, people who are near death and can happen within the, the few days preceding their uh, eventual expiration. And... Chain stokes breathing is kind of what I was describing before. You know, it, it will start fairly uh, slowly and then it becomes rapid and more deeper and then kind of goes through a cycle. And then you have uh, central nervous system, uh, or excuse me, central neurogenic hyperventilation. And that's just what it says it is, and it's usually re related to uh, head trauma. And then you have Kuzmal respirations, which are very deep and very rapid respirations that are associated with diabetes uh, dia diabetic ketoacidosis very high blood sugar in the body and then atax uh, ataxic by by its uh, respiration uh, if you don't know at least be able to describe what you hear so you know you don't necessarily have to go around and say oh well this is you know Kuzmal respirations or this is you know central neurogenic hyperventilation not necessary it's really only necessary that you describe exactly what the ventilations are like so this is some of this information is somewhat gee whiz so here's a, a good little illustration of the different waveforms that these uh, respirations will take. Uh, you can see normal respiration kind of, you know, up and down at a very, um, not not too extreme. And then you have uh, biots respirations where there's, uh, you know, some very deep breathing and then all of a sudden it cuts off and then and you've got some more deep breathing. And then you have... Um, 
Kuzma breathing right here was just a lot of really deep and quick breathing. And finally, Chain Stokes uh, respiration, which is not not a good thing. Okay, so blood pressure. What's a normal blood pressure? Well, usually the systolic is going to be 100 plus age up to 140. But it's not going to be less than 80. And the diastolic is not greater than 90. Or systolic is equal to 120 plus age in years over 40. The diastolic not greater than 90. The, important, the most important number for you to remember here is the diastolic number. So when you have a blood pressure that is greater than 90 for diastolic, you have a little bit of mild hypertension. As that number rises, the condition of hypertension becomes more severe. So when we're talking uh, 90 to 100 or 90 to uh, you know, 99, it's very mild. When you're talking 100 to 110, this is moderate. And when you're talking 110 to 120, this is for a diastolic number, again, the bottom number. Uh, 110 to 120 is, is severe. Now, 120 plus is a severe hypertensive crisis, an immediate emergency. This person needs to get to the hospital as soon as possible, and they need to have their blood pressure checked or their uh, blood pressure condition taken care of, rather. So uh, nowadays, when you have an extreme blood pressure um, on the diastolic end, you'll see that this is uh, more of an issue that's associated with not taking blood pressure medications when the patient was supposed to. So this can be a problem for patients who were, you know, all of a sudden just stopped taking the blood pressure medication, thought they needed to take it, and now they have these ridiculous blood pressures. Because the body gets used to taking that medication, and when it stops taking it, then it can become a serious problem for people. So just something to keep in mind. Obviously, you know, people will vary in what their blood pressure is. If the systolic number is over 140, it is cause for concern. Uh, but again, not as big of a cause con for concern as di rising diastolic numbers. And systolic, systolic uh, pressure, also remember, is when the heart is contracting and uh, diastolic blood pressure is, is when it's relaxed. So these two numbers are different for that reason. And then you can, all ha you can also have so all sorts of other things that occur, as, um, which we'll go over in the patient assessment uh, section. Uh, you can also you can take a blood pressure by oscillating it, and you can take another one by just palpating it. That means feeling the radial area or the radial pulse and checking by palpation. Orthostatic hypotension, very interesting, uh, interesting one. Um, orthostatic blood pressure is defined as a systolic blood pressure decrease of at least 20 millimeters of mercury or diastolic blood pressure decrease of at least 10 millimeters of mercury within three minutes of standing. It may also be associated with an increase in the patient's pulse rate. Uh, it's, it is in indicative of hypoperfusion, which is shock. When caring for a patient who begins to experience dizziness related to the positional changes, you should immediately lie the patient down. Now, if your patient becomes dizzy, if they become dizzy, when you stand them up, they are positive for orthostatic hypotension. It doesn't matter what the va values are. If you stand them up and they become dizzy, they are automatically positive. Do not sit there and worry about trying to take a, you know, a full range of, of values. You've just caused them to become dizzy. Do not try to stand them up, sit them back down, lay them down, and have them relax because this is not a good situation for them to be in. It puts a lot of strain on their body. So again, and you can report that to the emergency department staff when you get to the hospital. You can tell them, hey, we tried to take orthostatics on this person. But what ended up happening was they got dizzy 
and we didn't want them to get any worse, so we sat them back down. And that is a positive for orthostatic hypotension, so it's not necessary to go through and get these values. It is still necessary, of course, for you to take the blood pressure in regular intervals, but it isn't necessary for you to go through and try to get a standing blood pressure and a sitting blood pressure and a laying blood pressure. They are obviously, again, positive for it. So skin color. Skin color normally should be pink um, if it's not, and it's pale or white or gray. That could indicate shock. If it's flushed or red, there could be uh, carbon monoxide poisoning going on. The blood pressure could be elevated. The patient could be experiencing a fever. If the patient is blue, uh, oxygen is usually low. They could be hypoxic. Uh, more you'll see the blue in kids rather than in adults. In adults, it seems to be more of a grayish color. But kids, definitely you'll see this bluish color when they become hypoxic. And yellow and jaundice, well, obviously that's going to be liver injury or failure hepatitis or cirrhosis. Now let's talk about skin. So we have temperature, texture, and condition. Skin, color, condition, and uh, texture. So is it, uh, is it warm? Is it cool or hot? This is in temperature. Um, is it wet? Is it dry? What kind of condition are we talking about? Mottled, turgor? Uh, what exactly is it that's happening with the skin? Uh, pupil will say for pupils, pupils are perla, pupils are equal, round, reactive to light with accommodation. And what is accommodation? Accommodation is a situation where they are able to focus. So this is really difficult to assess. Um, it's kind of one of those debatable things and and uh, a lot of times it's just it's more re uh, more recommended that you write p e r l uh, on the patient care report because it's such an objective or such a subjective thing to put on the patient care report in any event uh are there any abnormal conditions such as nystagmus or a disconjugate gaze and, uh, you know, is there an irregular shape? Do they have any eye trauma? Is there a sluggish reaction? Dilation, pinpoint. So is the, are the eyes blown out, uh, blown up, or are they really small? Uh, you know, all of, the, all of these things just kind of indicative of different conditions. Obviously, if they are dilated, this could be a problem with a CNS depressant. Uh, if they're pinpoint, this could be a CNS stimulant. If you have unequal pupils, you may have an issue with some kind of a head injury. So all of those things are important to note with regard to the way that the eyes look. For pulse oximetry, um, a normal SpO2 is going to be anywhere from 93 to 99%. Now, uh, normal normally... Uh, individuals are going to be within the 96 to 99 percent range and so if you got a patient that is in between 93 and 96 and they're experiencing difficulty with breathing it is probably a good idea to make sure that you put them on oxygen in fact even if they are above 96 that you should probably still treat them because you're treating the patient and not the diagnostic tools that you have. So hypoxia again here is 93%, but remember pulse or oximetry may be used as a vital sign tool in order to confirm adequate breathing along with other factors. So it's a confirmatory mechanism and not necessarily a diagnostic mechanism. So very important to know the, distinguish, the distinguishing um, features between you know diagnostic and um, confirming. Blood sugar monitoring. So what are the reasons why we would decide to do blood sugar monitoring or blood glucose monitoring rather? Um, do they have an altered level of consciousness? Um, if they are altered or they're unconscious, um, we are definitely going to want to do this to see if there is a diabetic issue, you know, or if there's a, a low sugar problem. 
did they uh, or were they dizzy? Um, did they have a history of diabetes? You know, um, all of these are the sorts of things that you would want to make sure that you check the blood sugar for. And then syncope and diaphoresis. Now, um, also, I would say syncope as well, just on its own, is something that is indicative or that would uh, indicate a uh, blood glucose monitoring. And this is because we don't necessarily know. Just because they passed out and didn't sweat a whole bunch doesn't mean that they aren't having a blood sugar problem. But just something to think about. Also, supportive measures absolutely positively need to include oxygen before you do anything else. So before you, you know, do what your local protocol is and give them blood sh or give them glucose, or before the medics decide to give them, um, you know, dextrose or whatever. Make sure you put them on oxygen. You would be amazed all the things that oxygen can correct a lot quicker than giving them some sugar. So just as the body needs, um, you know, blood sugar in order to operate efficiently, it also needs um, oxygen. In any event, we have uh, different values here. Now, 80 to um, 120, apologize for that. Uh, 80 to 120 is going to be considered to be about the mid-range. And remember when I talked to you before, it was about 60 to 100 is is kind of what you're looking for. Um, those are probably your your better values. But a normal range can be in between 60 and 150. Um, you know, the low range obviously is anything less than 60. And the high range is, is anything above 150. However, you will have some kind of concerns if you're, you know, hitting above 120. And then also remember, a lot of this is situational. So did they just eat? If they just ate, you can expect it to be higher. If they haven't had a meal in a long time, you can expect it to be a little bit lower. So these are just like ranges for you guys to keep in mind. Again, it's very important to remember that just because you have ranges does not mean that every patient uh, needs to fall within those ranges all the time. They're just ranges to help you kind of get a bigger overall picture of what's going on with the patient. And then uh, we have diabetic keto, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Having worked um, for a very long time with the Native American population, we saw blood sugars um, in excess of 300, 400, and 500 on a regular basis. In fact, so high where the uh, blood glucose um, machine would not read and it would say it was too high. So uh, these were a little bit different for us in our particular population. But um, normally in, you know, throughout the country, DKA will set in between 250 and 500 milligrams. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Also, glucometers need to be tested on a regular basis. It is important for you to do the test strip um, and then make sure you have the right chip, chip in. But technology is also changing too. So um, you know, like we have these advanced chips to put in into them that don't necessarily need to be changed out. Um, but just know what which one you need to do. So let's talk about exactly how you should be doing blood uh, glucose monitoring. You're going to want to set out the glucometer and the test strip, the Lancet, all this stuff. And uh, the ideal location is going to be uh, the ring or middle finger of the non-dominant hand. The reason is because they're not going to be using this particular finger on a regular basis. So just think of like where would you do the, uh, if the patient's going to be doing writing, you know, or they're going to be using a pencil or a pen, um, you know, best thing for you to do is make sure that you're not poking those parts of the, uh, of their digits where they could be using them. And then, you know, it's just kind of a patient comfort and, and a consideration thing. Uh, newer meters have the ability to test smaller amounts from different locations as well. So, you know, you might go kind of like on the side of the finger or in, you know, even in the arm or in the wrist. Um, some of them do that as well. You turn this glucometer on, you place the test strip inside according to the directions, and you wipe the area with an alcohol prep so that you make sure it's a little bit clean. And then, um, you know, when it talks about milking the patient's finger, to try to warm it up. So um, one, of the, one of the things, I've, I've taken a lot of blood sugars again, like I said, and uh, we've been in a very high uh, risk population area. So 
I've taken a lot of blood sugars. And what I found that works the best is making sure that their, their arm hangs below the, uh, their heart and for a while. And then also kind of squeezing on their wrist, um, and not just their wrist, but, but on the middle of their arm, um, just below the elbow, and get some of that blood down. And then just kind of squeeze, kind of squeeze a little bit, a couple times, two, three times. And then you get that blood flow coming in. And then just do a couple little pinches on the hand. And then, um, you know, a little bit of pinch on the fingers. Um, very light pinching, I would say. And then you go through and you hold it. And then you prick it. And then once you prick it, um, you'll see the uh, meaty portion of the horseshoe. Be wary of the patient's nail bed. Don't hit that nail bed because that'll hurt. So do whatever you can not to hit the nail bed. And then dispose of this lancet in the sharps container when you're done with it. Um, wipe off the first drop of blood. Uh, and the reason is because this could contain, you know, some nasty stuff that you don't necessarily need. Um, it is it is nice and, and kind of cool when you don't have to sit there and worry about having um, any blood on anything, but in all reality, the best thing for you to do is to, to make sure you wipe this blood off first so you can get a nice clean uh, strip and get a good diagnostic of what the values are going to be. And then let the test strip vacuum the blood out. This is a very passive process. So we're not forcing the finger into the test strip. We're just kind of very lightly putting the test strip um, w right next to where the blood is coming out and then it's just going to take it very easily. This is a very nice, soft uh, process. And then once you're done, um, obviously you're going to use a little uh, piece of gauze and then have them, and then you can stop the bleeding and then make sure the bleeding stops and then put, the, uh, put a Band-Aid on. Make sure the sample taken was usable before cleaning the patient's finger off and applying the pressure of Band-Aid too. Um, you know, test strips are sensitive to heat and they can actually warp with excessive heat. So if the patient's on blood thinners, remember that. Pulse oximetry, um, how does it work and why should we care? Well, um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of pulse oxes. You might have a pulse ox that, I love these older pictures here, you might have a, a pulse ox that is mobile. You may have one that's attached um, to your uh, unit. You may have one that's attached to a heart monitor. Um, there's also these um, really teeny tiny ones that you would put on pediatric patients. So you got to make sure that you get the sensor right and that would require additional training at your particular department. But the indications for pulse oximetry uh, generally fall into two categories. Um, we really want to just find out if the patient's hypoxic or if uh, or what is going on with our therapeutic interventions. So, you know, did, say when we put them ox on oxygen, did their, um, excuse me, when we put them on oxygen, did their pulse oximetry reading go higher? And how does it work? Well, it's called Beer's Law. And Beer's Law is that light's absorbed by tissues and doesn't use or doesn't uh, vary with the cardiac cycle. So during the cardiac cycle, there, there's a small increase in arterial blood and the light absorption is increased during this phase. So pretty interesting the way that that works. Um, and this is just kind of a very simplistic view of the way that it works. So um, we have kind of a balancing act here uh, where more light is absorbed and you'll see that the, the SpO2 reading increases here on this right on the right hand side. <laughs> and uh, so let's let's talk very briefly about arterial bl uh, blood gases. Um, this is kind of a, a very very brief uh, overview and the only reason why we even go through this at the EMT level is because this might be something where you're given information on say an inner facility transport and you if you might just be curious as to what the values are and what they mean. Um, so we have values at sea level to, which are 760 TOR 
or 14.7 uh, P SIG. Now the idea here is that they will change um, when you're at different uh, varying altitudes. Um, but generally speaking, uh, you want a P PaO2 of 75 to 100, uh, PaCO2 of 35 to 45. And then um, pH is a real gee whiz thing, 7.35 to 7.45. And then you have uh, the oxygen saturation. Again, see how there's a little bit of a difference here, um, even with this particular section it says it should be 94 to 100 and the other one said 93 to 96 so these all these are all just ranges and you're not going to be tested necessarily on the ranges that are not um, that are so close and then you have a uh, HCO3 uh, which is 22 to 26 so just remember um, you know these are just kind of a G whiz thing that you might experience say in an inter facility transport all at altitudes of 3,000 feet and above the values for oxygen are lower um, SpO2 is a non-invasive oxygen saturation. SaO2 is an arterial oxygen saturation. So they basically are testing the actual art, um, hemoglobin mo molecules. And then the PaO2 is uh, arterial pressure, partial pressure of oxygen dissolved in the plasma. And again, I'm just going to go through this very, very briefly. Um, and then let's go back to CaO2, total amount of oxygen in the blood or this SaO2 plus PaO2. And this is kind of, um, again, very G whiz information. All right. And then we have 97 to 100%, good gas exchange, mild hypoxia, and then severe hypoxia. So again, we talked about these a little bit. Um, not all patients are the same. COPD and anemia, again, may have different values. You may have a COPD patient, you know, that typically sats in the high 80s, and that just might be normal for them. So just know that, and you know, whereas that might kill somebody else. So just something to think about. And here's a little gee whiz graph for you. Um, and another one. All right, so uh, caution, uh, indirect assessment of the, of the adequacy of ventilation. Hypoventilation or hypercarbia may proceed, uh, or may proceed decrease in saturations by many minutes. So, you know, just something to think about. Supplemental oxygen may mask hypoventilation and CO2 retention. So if we have CO2 retention, um, we can have a chemical imbalance inside the body. And again, this is kind of more advanced life support information, but gee whiz for you in case you were curious. Um, caution, pulse extremity can give accurate readings down to the hemoglobin levels of 5 mgdl. Um, SpO2 levels below 70 might produce inaccurate readings. So just something to think about. Peripheral circulation should always be intact. And practice pearls. Don't introduce yourself by the pulse ox because it looks bad when you say, you know, I, I've got a patient who's setting it, you know, 87%, and, you know, here they are up and talking to you, and everything's just fine. There's no issues, and, you know, they're a COPD patient, and, you know, they're, they're having another issue that's unrelated to what you're talking about, and you're freaking out about it. So, you know, another thing to think about, too, is you can have a dirty finger, and uh, that can cause an issue with your SpO2 levels. Not only that, but you can also have a dirty uh, pulse ox, pulse ox um, which will cause lower values. That's why it's always a good idea to make sure you clean your pulse ox at the beginning of each shift. So it is a diagnostic tool. It is not your brain. And uh, just know the limitations of the technology. Treat the patient and not their SpO2. And that's going to do it for this section.